A strength training program is designed to improve core strength. To test its effectiveness, 12 patients are timed in seconds while holding a position called the plank before and after a three-week strength program. Use the data below to construct a 95% confidence interval for the true mean difference between pre-core strength and post-core strength. Is zero in the interval? If so, what does this tell us? Okay, so what we want to do here is first identify what technique we're supposed to use to solve the problem. And it clearly says construct a 95% confidence interval, right? And it tells you it's for the true mean difference. So that's a little small on your screen probably, but it says mean difference. So it's implied by the notation that this is a dependent t-test. And of course, when we look at the layout of the data, it's also a clue that it's the dependent t-test we're dealing with. Because of course, we have a pre-program, post-program, right? So they test them in the plank before, and then afterwards, they, after doing the three-week strength program, they give them another test to see how long they can hold the plank. So it looks like, you know, obviously, it's the same subject being tested pre and post the weight training program. So clearly, these are dependent data points, right? So there's two separate groups of data, but they're dependent upon one another because they're linked by the subjects who are taking the tests. Okay, good. So at this point, what I've done is I've calculated the row of differences here at the bottom to help us. And I've already calculated the mean, the standard deviation, and so on for that data so that we can use it in our uh, confidence interval. So let's start with the first step of a confidence interval, which of course is to list all that data. And so what I'm going to do is just write down the variables that you should fill in when you're working a confidence interval with this kind of problem. So you're going to have an n sub d, which is the number of differences present. If you count, you're going to see that there's 12. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. There are 12 differences in our list here. Then we're going to have an x bar or an average for the differences. When I worked that out in my calculator, I came up with the answer minus 50.083 repeating. So minus 50.083 repeating. And then standard deviation for the differences. When I worked that in my calculator, I got the answer 24.3999. So 24.3999. Okay. And then from there, basically, we're going to take the confidence level from the problem, which they say is 95%. Of course, that means that alpha is 0 0.05. Okay, so step one, getting the data is done. Now, step two is the step where we would normally get our table value. So it's going to be a T alpha divided by two value for a confidence interval where the sample size is small. And to get that T alpha divided by two value, we're going to be looking at 0 0.05, essentially in two tails, so we'll actually have to divide that in half, so use 0 0.025, right? And the degrees of freedom for the problem is going to be 11. So let's see what that ends up giving us by going to the table and looking up T.025 with degrees of freedom 11. Okay, so we're looking at 0 0.025 and 11 degrees of freedom. We find the answer 2.201. So our table value is 2.201, 2.201. And once we have that uh, critical T value, we can now plug it into the margin of error formula. The margin of error, of course, is going to be T alpha divided by 2 times S sub D divided by the square root of N sub D. So kind of the classic margin of error formula we've always used. And then 2.201 times the standard deviation, which is going to be 24.3999 all over the square root of 12. Okay, so let's see what that ends up giving us for the error. Okay, so we're going to say that it's 2.201 times 24.3999 divided by the square root of 12. Okay, and when we work that out, we end up with the answer 15.503. So 15.50306 dot dot dot, it repeats on and on. Okay, so there's our margin of error. I'm going to store that in my calculator as x, so I have it for later use, okay? Now, in the next step, we're going to plug that margin of error into our standard formula, x bar d minus the error, x bar d plus the error. So we'll have x bar d minus the error, comma, x bar d plus the error. All 
right, so x bar d is minus 50.083 repeating, minus the error we just calculated, which is 15.50306 dot dot dot, right? So that's the first half of that interval. And then we're going to continue, it'll be the minus 50.083 repeating plus the 15.50306 dot dot dot. And when we're done, we'll have our interval. Okay, so let's calculate our interval using that information. So we're going to say minus 50.0833333 minus my error. And then we'll do the same calculation, only plus the error this time. All right, when we're done with that, we end up with the answer for the interval to be minus 65.586. Up to minus 34.580. Okay, so that's our interval, and what we're saying is that the average difference is going to be inside of that interval. Now, that interval does not contain zero. The question they ask us is, does the interval contain zero? And the answer is no, it doesn't. And what does that tell us if it doesn't contain zero? Well, let's think about how we did the subtraction. I did the subtraction, if you look at it, I did pre-program minus post-program, and the result was negative here. In fact, it's negative for all the values at the bottom here, which means for every person in the program, their core strength must have increased because they can hold the plank longer after the program. The length of time that they held the plank increased after the program. Right? And so we did the subtraction, this guy minus this guy, and we got these negative differences because the bottom numbers were bigger. And that means that essentially when the interval is all negative like that, what it's basically saying is that the average difference is negative, which essentially means that we can conclude that there's a statistically significant improvement between the post-program results and the pre-program results. In other words, doing the strength program for three weeks does increase the length of time that you can hold the plank, which is a marker of how strong your core is, right? So that's basically the answer to the problem. Of course, what these times specifically mean is that the difference between, for typical people, the difference between the pre- and post-program length of time uh, that they can hold the plank is going to be somewhere between minus 34 seconds up to minus 66 seconds roughly, right? So somewhere in there is the true average difference between the pre and post program plank times. And so that's essentially showing that the post, post the exercise strength program, you can hold the plank longer.